Amen. Amen. And Father, we also pray as we come before your word tonight that we'll have open spiritual eyes and listening spiritual ears that will hear, that will understand, Father God, that the Holy Spirit will speak to us our part of it, Father, that we'll know what we need to do in order to be victorious, in order to be the overcomers that you've called us to be. And we thank you for it. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, tonight we're going to be talking about prayer and receiving what receiving what you asked for specifically. Okay? I think I'm going to have to take these off because I can't see the outline. So, there it is. You know, Jesus left us some wonderful prayer promises. And I honestly think that sometimes people just think they're too good to be true. Okay? And sometimes without us even realizing it, unbelief can set in right there as they read what it says in the Bible. And sometimes people say to themselves, and sometimes they say to others, he can't really mean that, or there has to be a catch. Now, we know that there are, there are some qualifiers and some things that we need to look into, and we're going to talk about what they are today. But first, we're going to read what Jesus said, because he made it very simple. And for the beginning of this, we're going to go to Matthew chapter 7. So many times, he told us that all we have to do is ask. Matthew chapter 7 Starting at verse 7, it says, Ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives, and he who seeks finds. And to him who knocks, it will be opened. Or what man is there among you who, if his son asks for bread, will give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, will he give him a serpent? If you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father, who is in heaven, give good things to those who ask him? And I'm going to just read this from Luke 11:13 because he just added, he said that whole thing, and he added a really good part to it. He said, if you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? And here's another one. And some of these I'm not going to turn there. I just have them written down. And we're just going to read it and look into it. He said it a lot. Matthew 21, 22. Whatever things you ask in prayer, believing, you will receive. Mark 11, 24. Therefore I say to you, whatever things you ask when you pray, believe that you receive them and you will have them. John 14, starting at verse 12. Most assuredly, I say to you, he who believes in me, the works that I do, he will do also. And greater works than these he will do, because I go to my Father. And whatever you ask in my name, that I will do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you ask anything in my name, I will do it. John 15, 7. If you abide in me, and my words abide in you, you will ask what you desire, and it shall be done for you. And John 16, 23 and 24. And in that day you will ask me nothing. Most assuredly I say to you, whatever you ask the Father in my name, he will give you. Until now you have asked nothing in my name. Ask and you will receive that your joy may be full. Jesus was quite clear. The Father God wants us to ask him for what we need and he wants to answer our prayers. And unlike insurance commercials, he did not give a small print list of things that he really is unable to do given current economic and political conditions. Did he? That's something sometimes we put on him, but that's not something he put on himself. And we need to remember that. He doesn't have fine print that says everything except this, 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 this and this. Except when this is happening. He did say that we have to believe and we have to abide in him and let his words abide in us. So what exactly do we have to believe in order for prayers to be answered? There's two main things that we have to believe. 
We have to believe he can, and we have to believe he will. Those are the things. We have to believe he can. We have to believe he will. Let's turn to Mark chapter 9. Mark chapter 9, starting at verse 14. It says, this was a father who, who brought his son when and Jesus had just been transfigured. It says, and when he came to the disciples, he saw a great multitude around them and scribes disputing with them. Immediately when they saw him, all the people were greatly amazed and running to him, greeted him, and he asked the scribes, what are you discussing with them? Then one of the crowd answered and said, teacher, I brought you my son who has a mute spirit. And wherever it seizes him, it throws him down. He foams at the mouth, gnashes his teeth, and becomes rigid. So I spoke to your disciples that they should cast it out, but they could not. He answered and said, O oh, faithless generation, how long shall I be with you? How long shall I bear with you? Bring him to me. Then they brought him to him, and when he saw him, immediately the spirit convulsed him, and he fell on the ground and wallowed, foaming at the mouth. So he asked his father, how long has this been happening to him? And he said, from childhood. And often he has thrown him both into the fire and into the water to destroy him. But if you can do anything, have compassion on us and help us. And Jesus said to him, if you can believe, all things are possible to him who believes. Immediately the father of the child cried out and said with tears, Lord, I believe, help my unbelief. And when Jesus saw that the people came running together, he rebuked the unclean spirit, saying to it, Deaf and dumb spirit, I command you, come out of him and enter him no more. Then the spirit cried out, convulsed him greatly, and came out of him. And he became as one dead, so that many said, He is dead. But Jesus took him by the hand and lifted him up, and he arose. And when he had come into the house, his disciples asked him privately, Why could we not cast it out? So he said to them, this kind can come out by nothing but prayer and fasting. Now, we have to believe that he can and that he will. Notice when this guy came to him, he said, but if you can, did he, was he absolutely certain that Jesus could? No, he said, if you can, please do something. And the disciples, of course, had already been unsuccessful. Notice though, we need to realize what's going on here. He was putting it off on Jesus. He was putting it off on Jesus. He said, if you can. And here's the thing, we know that before this time the disciples had been successfully dealing with stuff like this also. But had Jesus also been dealing successfully with stuff like this? Yeah, he had. And yet this guy still came and said, if he'd heard testimonies, he'd heard stuff, or I guess, or he wouldn't have been there, but he's still saying, if you can. He tried to put it off on Jesus, and Jesus put it right back on him, and he said, no, if you can. If you can do what? If you can believe. So very important part of receiving what you ask for. You have to believe. You have to believe he can, and you have to believe he will. That's the first place we need to check up on, is what we believe. And one way we check what we believe is by listening to what we're saying when we're not before God in prayer. <laughs> good. That's good. We need to check good. on what we're saying when we're not before God in prayer. Because what's spontaneously coming out of us is what we believe. That's right. Obviously, when we go before God in prayer, we're there to try to do what? Change things. Yep. But what we believe is is what springs out of us when we're not necessarily there saying, okay, I'm going to get this right because I need a change. That's how we can check up on what we believe. Also, we need to realize that believe is not the same thing in hope, 
as hope. Now, in the Bible, hope means that we expect something to happen firmly. And that's something that we need to renew our minds to because in the world where we live, hope usually means I want it to happen. I wish it would happen, but I'm not sure it will. And so sometimes when people read hope in the Bible, they're putting the world's definition on that hope. That doesn't work. We have to remember in the Bible when it says hope, that word means earnest expectation. It's not something you're just wishing for. It's something you firmly expect to happen in the future. This guy, and that's sort of what this guy was saying, wasn't it, to Jesus. Well, I want it to happen, but I'm not really sure. You have to believe to receive what you pray for, because Jesus said all things are possible to them that believe. We have to believe that he will do it. And we read scripture just before from Matthew 7 that says, you know, look, I want to do good things for you. So we can believe that God wants to do good. But now we also have to believe that he, not just that he wants to, but that he can. And sometimes in this world, it seems that people, and it's true, Satan is the god of this world, but it seems like somewhere in people's heads that gets in there to translate to, well, Satan can, you know, do a whole bunch of stuff and there's, not much God can do about it. Is that a true statement? No. no, but sometimes I think subconsciously that's what's sitting in the back of people's heads. Well, Satan is the God of this world, so he has a right to do this. And, you know, well, maybe God can and maybe he can't, you know, because after all, he let him, you know, have a charge. Jesus can do something about it. Remember when he died before he was resurrected? He defeated the principalities and powers. Now, I'm going to look at Ephesians 6.12 for this one. It is talking about prayer there, Ephesians 6.12. But this is where it tells us clearly who the enemy is. It says, For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness, in the heavenly places. That is who the enemy is, right? And, you know, when when we get beyond the realm of, I mean, part of this is just praying about things for ourselves that we need, but when we start praying for governments and stuff like that, and even other people, we have to remember the enemy is not the people. They may be being used by the devil, but it's not the people. It's the people are not the problem. Because so many times people, even when they pray, you go at the people like, no, you got to hit the devil where it hurts, which means addressing the principalities and powers. Let's turn to Colossians 2.15. The same principalities and powers that are the enemy. This is talking about Jesus here. It says, having disarmed principalities and powers, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them in it. Okay, so they know they're defeated by him, don't they? They know it. But sometimes it seems like God's people aren't so sure about that. And when stuff starts happening in the world and it's, you know, just because the devil's rising doesn't mean that we can't do anything about it because Jesus already defeated these things. They're done. He won. It's over. He has the power. And that is why he can go to work and do something in your life because he defeated that enemy. They can't they can't control the people of his kingdom anymore. Satan is still the god of this world, but there is a kingdom that Jesus said does not come with observation, meaning it's not natural right now. His kingdom right now is a spiritual kingdom. He, he right now 
is and has established his kingdom. The spiritual kingdom is established on the earth. And in order to start that kingdom, he defeated those principalities and powers so that we could come into that kingdom, right? So God can do something about it. Jesus can. In fact, he already has, hasn't he? He already defeated them. And we know that he's willing. So when we pray, we need to expect to receive, but we need to believe this also. Let's look at 1 Peter chapter 5. Speaking of principalities and powers and what they do. First Peter chapter five. And we're going to start reading at verse eight. It says, Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary the devil walks about like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. Resist him steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same sufferings are experienced by your brotherhood in the world. But may the God of all grace, who called us to his eternal glory by Christ Jesus, after you have suffered a while, perfect, establish, strengthen, and settle you. Okay, so the devil is looking for people that he may devour. He may devour. So is he positive that it's going to happen? No. He's just looking for opportunities. He's looking to see what he can do. Sometimes it seems like as soon as there are circumstances in life that go contrary to the word, people hand him the victory because they believe that the devil can and he will, rather than believing that Jesus can, and he will. And we hand him the victory before it's even before it even it even gets going. And why do they believe this? Because they're looking at the natural as their basis for belief. They're looking at the natural. We must believe God's word first and be patient for the natural to line up. We have firm examples of this in the Bible. Everyone who received from God had to believe when the natural did not look like it could line up. They all had to believe that what God said would happen anyway. And we will have to do that also. Now, before he talks about the devil being looking for people to devour, it says to be sober and to be vigilant. Now, those words in the footnotes of at least one version I was looking at say they can translate to be self-controlled and watchful. Self-controlled and watchful. Why do we need to be those things? Because those are the indicators that he might have a chance with you. That's how he knows that it Maybe time to do something. Not that it'll automatically happen, but it might be time. People whose flesh is out of control in any area are signaling vulnerability. Self, he said to be self-controlled, whether it's addiction, anger, pride, covetousness, all that sends a message that he can clearly read that you're not walking in the spirit like you need to and you might be weak. You might be open for it. And I just said might. It doesn't It doesn't mean that it has to happen. But you might be open. So that's why he says to be self-controlled. The next thing he says is to be watchful. Are your eyes on God's word? Or are you attending to secular TV shows and other media? Those things are easily observable. There, there is a spirit world around us, and he can see what you're doing. They can see what you're watching, and they can see how you're acting. And just like in a herd and a pack mentality, that's how the lions know who to go for. Well, he's watching to see what he can slip in. And remember, lions don't attack the strong. They go after the weak. They separate them from the herd, and then they take them down. 
So that's how we, if we are watchful, self-controlled and watchful, we can stop. We won't at least be signaling to him that, you know, there might be an in here. Even if you are vulnerable, though, it doesn't mean that he gets the victory. Because the next verse says to stand up, resist the devil, and stand firm in the faith. Don't allow your circumstances to separate you from your faith. Don't allow them to take the upper hand and say and become what you believe. We have to walk in the Spirit and believe the Word of God. One way that people let their circumstances separate them from faith is that, like the guy in the story, they blame God for what's going on. And there are people who do this, but they don't always realize it. Like, they never come out and say, well, God is the reason for this. But we can't allow ourselves to be separated by unbelief. Because if we allow ourselves to be separated from God, we are cutting ourselves off from the only source of victory and salvation. Don't ask why. Like, why did he allow this to happen? Or why didn't he cover you? Or why, 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 why? Now is not the time to ask why. Because at this point, does why matter? Hmm? No, it's there. Why no longer matters. Why already happened and that that ship sailed. Now it's time. It's here. Amen. Deal with it. Resist it. That's good. That's good stuff. Hmm. The next thing he said in verse 9 after resisting him, these things happen to every Christian in the world. They happen to everybody. So the other thing we don't want to do is separate ourselves from the prayers and the help of others. And if you are the other person, the other, we need to be sending prayers and materials to help the hurting people. So many times when people look to help people, they engage in why did this happen or trying to find blame for something. Again, that's not helpful. When we're coming along to lift people up, we just need to love them, to pray for them, and to do anything that we can to make it easier. Right? Lay it at the devil's feet and take up the fight of faith. Even when you're called upon to do it for people who are going through tough times, just leave it at it's the devil and take up the fight of faith and the prayer of agreement. The prayer of agreement with them. Now, did you notice it says, after you have suffered a while, and that always makes people cringe, but we all know what I think he means there. Don't get discouraged when the natural doesn't change right away. Don't get discouraged and give up on your belief because things haven't happened as quickly as you wanted them to. Stay in the fight because the enemy has already been defeated. Stay in the fight. Because how does this end? He said in verse 10, it ends with more maturity, more strength, and firmer faith. As long as you don't give up. That all you have to do to receive the answer to your prayers is not give up. And remember that resisting the devil strengthens your faith muscles. It will be easier next time. Now let's turn it back over to 1 John chapter 5. Remember we're talking about receiving, receiving the answer to our prayers. 1 John chapter 5, starting at verse 14. 1 John 5, 14, it says, Now this is the confidence that we have in him, that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And if we know that he hears us, whatever we ask, we know that we have the petitions that we have asked of him. So he's saying, ask according to his will, and he hears. If he hears, we have what we've asked for. So 
So it has to be, when we pray, we have to know that we're praying according to his will. Well, how do we know his will? There are two ways. By the word and by the spirit. Remember in John 15, what, Jesus, what John said here is remarkably similar to what he wrote about what Jesus said in John 15. And the first thing he said was, if my words abide in you, you will ask what you will. If my words abide in you. So we definitely know his will by the word, but we also know it by the spirit. And what we ask for in prayer needs to be something already revealed to us by the word or by the spirit. Sometimes people hear whatever you desire and their mind goes to like this Christmas wish list for Santa to fulfill whatever you desire. And that's what people think about it. Oh, whatever I want, whatever I want. Well, mm, yes and no. If you abide with him, inherent in that abiding, if you are living with him, your abiding means that you're desiring the same thing, that you have the same goals, and that you are submitting to his will for your life. You're not telling him what you want. He is telling you what he wants. That's what it means there. However, from the word, we know that we can pray with confidence for healing, provision, and for salvation. For all those who call on the name of the Lord, these are all things that God has already said he would do. They're plainly laid out in scripture. We don't have to wonder if that's his will. It's always his will. Those things are in the word. But we do need to rely on the Holy Spirit for other things. Investments, giving, colleges, spouses, homes. Cars, he can spot a lemon if you will listen and submit and submit. I've heard testimonies about that. People just wanted to have that car and got that car, and you know what? Turned out to be a lemon, and then, God, why did this happen to me? Well, he knew it all along, but if you're determined to have your own way, are you going to have your own way? Yeah, sometimes to your own detriment, okay? So cars, jobs, promotions, even where and when to purchase what we need. That's what we need to rely on the Holy Spirit for. Proverbs 14, 12, and 16, 25 say the exact same thing. There is a way that seems right to a man, but its end is the way of death. If what you are praying for is not happening and it concerns something in these areas I'm not, I'm not talking about healing and I'm not talking about salvation and I'm not talking about provision like that but if you might want to go back and pray about figuring out where did this desire come from was it my idea or did the Holy Spirit say this is what he wanted for me okay and we need to get wisdom from God concerning it because if we're praying, so many times if we're praying and it's not happening, we just, sometimes we give up. There's a tendency to want to blame, blame God. Go back and ask why. Go back and ask what's going on. While you are standing, make a list of scriptures pertaining to the topic that promise you what you are asking for. I mean, we all sit and we pray and in our hearts we we know well I believe in healing I believe in provision I believe in this but it doesn't take away the idea that when things are taking time we need to put our eyes back on the word hey. and we need to claim those promises for ourselves we need to find them because in looking at that word faith comes yeah. And it's great to do devotions, but if you're in a battle, you have to look at the word concerning what you're fighting for. If you need something and it's not happening, that's the word you need to go find, dig up, and then stand on and keep in front of your eyes. 
if you can't find any scriptures, you might want to consider whether or not it's God's will. <laughs> if you can't find one single scripture, you better really consider whether what you're asking for is God's will. Because he hears and answers prayers that are in line with his will. And here's something else that he does. If he knows that something would hurt you spiritually or physically, it's not his will. And he will not bring it about. He only does good for people. Now, you can push and maybe bring it about anyway all by yourself. But understand, if he's not moving and it's one of these areas that you have to get with the Holy Spirit on, if the prayer isn't being answered, again, you need to figure out whether it's really his will. Because he knows things that we don't. And if he perceives that something is, if he not perceives, he knows. If something's going to hurt us in the future, he's not going to be the one to bring it about. Mm -hmm. And notice I said hurt us spiritually, not just physically. Because he only does good. Now, praying and receiving what you are asking for. The next place that we need to check up on is forgiveness. Let's look at Mark chapter 11. If we are believing and we know it's God's will and we have scripture on it, this is the next area that can cause problems for us. Mark 11, and we're going to read for this, 25 and 26. It says, And whenever you stand praying, if you have anything against anyone, forgive him, that your Father in heaven may also forgive you your trespasses. But if you do not forgive, neither will your Father in heaven forgive your trespasses. Yes, I know, probably half your Bibles admit, omit verse 26. Most of the Bibles that the kids read don't have 26. We just read this on Sunday, and um, the, per the person viewing the computer is like, there's something wrong with this Bible. It jumps from 1125 to 1127, and this wasn't even the scripture I was reading. It's like, there's no 26 in here. And I'm like, I know, because they say that it wasn't in some original manuscript a long time ago. Okay, well, here's a second witness, Matthew chapter 6. says, guess what? The exact same thing. Mm -hmm. Matthew chapter 6, verses 14 and 15, and nobody disputes verse 15 in this book. For if you forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive men their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. Now look up a couple verses there. What's going on right before this? Just like in Mark, Jesus was talking about prayer. Right before this, Jesus is talking about prayer. This is the Lord's Prayer. Look at verse 12. He put it right in his prayer. And forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. That's a part of prayer. This was Jesus teaching the disciples to pray. One of the most overlooked reasons for people not receiving, prayers not being answered, is unforgiveness. And it's important to us, especially at this time, because 2 Timothy 3.3 3 says that it is going to be a characteristic of people in the end times. Now, of course, it should not be a characteristic in the church, but we all live in the world. We're surrounded by worldly people, and sometimes their junk gets on us. This is something we need to lay down if we want our prayers to be answered. So what is unforgiveness. There was a couple of definitions. Uh, one says, and this is interesting, it says harsh or difficult not allowing for weakness or error. Now I know that doesn't everybody, that doesn't generally go, but think about it. Unforgiving person. Characteristics. Harsh, difficult, 
not allowing for weakness or error, doesn't that add up? It does, doesn't it? Yeah, People who are unforgiving often have those characteristics. And of course, the other definition is the opposite of forgiveness. So what does it mean to forgive? To cease to feel resentment again? To give up resentment or claim to requital? To grant relief from payment? Mm -hmm. Forgiveness. Overlooked reason why prayers aren't being answered. If you are believing and you know that you asked according to God's will, this is your next step. It's not always unbelief that is the problem. Right. You can be in unforgiveness towards someone who actually wronged someone else. <laughs> okay? It doesn't have to be about something that was done to you personally. Now, I know we've all done this a time or two, but just think about it in terms of unforgiveness. Remembering that driver that cut you off, it still makes you mad a week later. With people that we love and care about, if you can still remember a list of things that were done and bring them up in an argument. Hmm? Think about it. Forgiveness is usually mentioned with prayer because there's a connection. Sometimes, I don't know if this is all, but Brother Copeland says this is true, so I'm taking it from him. Sometimes we know exactly what the unforgiveness is, but sometimes we've forgotten about it, sort of. But it's still there. And that's where I said that resentment that comes back up. We've forgotten about it, sort of. Like we won't sit down and just remember it until either that person does something else or somebody else does something similar. And then we remember it and it's right there. Yeah. Unforgiveness. If you need to ask the Holy Spirit for wisdom in this area, he will let you know if there is a problem and where it is so that you can remember and take care of it. And just like that father in Mark 9, you can forgive by faith. You can say, Lord, I forgive. Help me. Just like he said, Lord, I believe. Help my unbelief. Lord, I forgive. Help my unforgiveness. To make it permanent, you have to take control over your mind and literally refuse to let it bring up those images and refuse to let it recite those hurtful things. If you stop it every time it comes in, if you stop it, this is part of being self-controlled, every time it comes in and say, nope, not remembering that, that's unforgiveness, eventually you won't remember. Eventually it will go away and you won't remember. And unforgiveness will not be able to stop your prayers. Now the last thing we need to check up on I touched on it a little before I was teaching the kids this on Sunday. We need to pray and speak the desire and not the problem. Yep, that was a great puppet, puppet skit. <laughs> Gloria Copeland, I was just watching them today and she said this, so I wrote it down. You don't meditate on the things you need. You meditate on the words to increase your capacity to receive. When worried thoughts come, we need to speak the word to them. Because hearing yourself speak the word out loud is one way that faith comes. Mm -hmm. Now we were talking to the kids about prayer. And in prayer you don't have to tell God how bad it is. <laughs> and we have a very funny we did something funny with that of people moaning about how bad they feel and how sick they are and how much they want this thing and that it's a funny puppet, puppet skit but the point is we don't have to it's basically I'll just explain it sure. yeah it's about calling it, calling the problem line instead of the desire line you remember that <laughs> one when you call the problem line Who's on the other end? The devil. The devil. 
when you call the desire line, who's going to pick up? God. <laughs> so, when we're rehearsing the problem, who are we talking to? The devil. Okay? That's right. We don't have to tell God how bad it is. We do have to ask for what we want to happen. Amen. We do have to ask him to step in and change. Mark 11:23 talks about speaking to problems because we don't have to pray for everything. Nope. And that's another message. But Mark 11:23 says, For assuredly I say to you, whoever says to this mountain, be removed, and be cast into the sea, and does not doubt in his heart, but believes that those things he says will be done, he will have whatever he says. Even the world has caught on to this principle. There are lots of success coaches out there, even secular ones, who grasp the importance of words and tell you to speak positively about yourself right. all the time. My kid, Katie's been taught that in business class. Johnny was taught that in some of his transfer classes. They believe this stuff and they teach it. And it's time the church caught up with it because we just read it's in the Bible. It's in there. And we need to believe it too. And the next thing we need to realize is that last words are the words that stand. You can pray and ask for healing, but if you run out and tell everyone how sick you are, sick is the last word spoken. Mm -hmm. you got to go back and pray again. The same thing also applies to some other touchier areas because we don't, hopefully as Christians, always just only pray for ourselves and for what we need and you know you can pray for the government and leaders to have wisdom and understanding but if you leave your prayer time and go out to complain and talk about how dumb they are <laughs> people do it all the time yeah. in various forms you just undid your prayers yeah. when you speak the word over the situation after it's spoken, you got to zip your lips and let that be the last word. It has got to be the last word, and we actually have to believe it, too. If you got to say something, thank God for it. Another note on speaking, again, I touched on this before, you need to pay attention to what you say because out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. When you're not on guard, you might be saying exactly what you really believe. So pay attention. What's just slipping out might be what you really believe. You have to believe when you pray. If you are speaking the opposite of what you prayed for, you won't receive it. Speaking the opposite of what you prayed for. Um, to understand the importance of this and the importance of listening to what you're speaking, Here's a technique that I've heard lots of people say most recently. Terry Savelle Foy, this is her version of it. I've heard other people do this also. But think about this and try this for a while. After every sentence you speak, add the word, and that's just the way I want it. <laughs> you will probably be very irritated with yourself in about 10 minutes. I've tried that on people and they were very irritated with me. And, you know, after five minutes, every negative thing, and that's just the way I want it. And that's just the way I want it. Because when we're speaking, we are creating our life. We are prophesying about ourselves. So, this is, that's very eye opening. If you will do it, I guarantee you, it will start to remind you, to help you to think, to change what you're speaking. There is so much that comes out of us that we don't even realize until somebody starts saying that after what we're saying, and then you can look at them and be like, or you can accept it and, you know, change. The point is to stop speaking anything that you don't want to happen. Stop 
speaking anything that you don't want to happen. If you will keep up with this, that sentence, and that's just the way I want it, if you will keep up with it and not give up in, fr in frustration, you will begin to change your words, which will change your life and what you're experiencing as a result. It will change you. So don't give up on prayer. Step up instead. We need to believe in God, his love, his goodness, and his ability to intervene on our behalf and to do something. Trust that his will for you is always good because Ephesians says he is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we could ask or think. Seek to have his will in your life instead of your own. Forgive everyone. Get a handle on the words you speak and only speak in line with his will. And then get ready to receive the things that you have asked for. And don't allow the devil or his associates to devour any more of your life. Let's pray. Dear Father in heaven, we thank you that when we pray and we submit to your will, Father, that your goodness and your love flows into our lives, Father, that you change our natural, that when we call on you, we are saved in whatever area we need salvation. We thank you for that promise, Father. We're here today because we believe, we trust in you. Holy Spirit, help us to mount a guard over our words. Help us to mount the guard over our hearts and stay in forgiveness, even though the temptation can be sometimes not to. Thank you for alerting us, for opening our eyes, Father, so that we will pray, we will receive the things that we've asked for, our joy will be full, and the world will be changed because we operate in your power and your authority. We thank you for it. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you.